Well, I don't know if you've ever had a neighbor that drives you crazy. Somebody who's annoying or frustrating or just makes you mad. But this morning, we're going to talk about that very thing. So you might be tempted this morning to shoot your rubber band at me, uh, but I'd like you not to do that. We're going to instead look at what kind of things annoy all of us. So if you have a rubber band and want to place that on your wrist, um, if you didn't grab a rubber band, feel free to pull out your cell phone and you can move it from hand to hand or a quarter or something like that. What are the people that it is hard to be friends with? Who are the people that annoy us? Have you ever been frustrated by the lawn slob? You drive by somebody's house, they haven't mowed, they haven't trimmed their bushes in months, weeks, years, and you think, have some respect, man! If you've ever been annoyed by the lawn slob, go ahead and move your rubber band over to the other hand. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's you're in a hurry, you run into a grocery store to grab something real quick, and as you get in, the lady in front of you is having a conversation with the cashier. Oh, yes, let me tell you what was going on. And you're like, come on, just got to get out of here. You get more and more frustrated, and finally they're about to check out, and like, oh, I think I have a coupon. A oh, coupon. And they're pulling out a coupon, and you're like, come on, come on, come on. And then they're going to write a check. Does anyone still use a checkbook? And you're getting more and more annoyed at that kind of person. Go ahead and move your rubber band over to the next hand. How about this road rage? You're driving along and you look in the rearview mirror and there's a guy weaving in and out of traffic. It is so unsafe. And he pulls up behind you bumper to bumper trying to get you to go faster by being four feet from your bumper. And you're like, what an idiot. That guy is always going too fast. He's going to kill somebody. If you've been annoyed by that person, go ahead and move your rubber band. How about the guy in the meeting, the woman in the meeting, who won't shut up? You cannot get a word in edgewise. You can't talk in any way. This person just talks and talks and talks. And you're thinking to yourself, especially if an introvert, why don't you shut up and think before you speak? Maybe putting some thought into your words before you sort of let it all out, you might actually say more intelligent things. If you've ever felt that way, go ahead and move your rubber band. How about the junk food junkie? I mean, this person is eating way too much junk food. Very, very much, you know, overweight. They ask for extra dessert. And, and, and the whole time you're thinking, boy, that does not seem healthy. That does not seem appropriate. And worse than that, after eating all that junk food, they're walking around in public wearing spandex. So go ahead and move your... <laughs> Now, as we're moving our rubber band back and forth, let's look at the other side. Maybe you haven't been annoyed at the lawn slob. Have you ever been annoyed at the lawn snob? The lawn snob who has nothing better to do that all day long they're trimming their grass. And then you get the note from the neighborhood covenant, the email saying, why can't we all be like 1205 Rudolph Street and have our lungs look so beautiful? And you're thinking, you know what? If I didn't have kids, if I didn't have active, if I was retired, maybe I could worship my lawn like the lawn snob. Maybe that's mine. I'll go ahead and move the rubber band over here to this one. Maybe it's not the person who's too slow in line. Maybe it's the line cutter. You're waiting in line. Somebody comes in, steps right in front of you as a new line forms. You're thinking, come on. Is your time more valuable than ours? That you can go faster than us? That you don't think you have to wait in line for traffic or for food the way we do? Go ahead and move your rubber band. Maybe it's not the guy trying to kill you from behind. You're driving in traffic. You're trying to get someplace, and you're trying to weave in and out of the people going way too slow because, come on, Gramps, when did you get your license anyway? Like before World War I? This is ridiculous. I've got places to go and things to see. And you're frustrated that traffic's going way too slow. Go ahead and move your rubber band. Maybe you're in a meeting. And you're trying to talk and engage people, and nobody else is engaging. In fact, you're so frustrated that this one person in the meeting hasn't talked for two hours. Instead of being in the meeting, they're checking their Twitter, they're checking their Facebook, they're on their phone, they're on their laptop doing who knows what. And you're thinking, come on, is your time more valuable than ours? We're all here to get something done. What's wrong with you? Go ahead and move the rubber band. Or maybe it's not the junk food junkie, it's the health food Nazi. Oh my goodness, the health food Nazi. 
And wow, they are always talking about their latest fad. They can't say the word meat out loud. And, and they, they are, are committed to make sure you never eat anything delicious in your entire life. If you felt that way, go ahead and move the rubber band. Isn't it amazing how all of us have this tendency toward self-righteousness to judge other people, to be annoyed by other people who don't operate the same speed we do, who don't think about life the way we do. And whether it's the snob or the slob, self-righteousness comes out of both of them. Whether it's the health food person or the junk food person, they both have a tendency to judge each other. Whether it's the guy who's the idiot behind you or you're the idiot pushing somebody else to go faster, we judge each other. The book of Jonah today is going to deal with that very issue. And this is our last week in book by book. And as we go through the series together, we're going to look at the book of Jonah. And I want to suggest to you that the book of Jonah, if you learned about it in Sunday school or have had a casual reference to it, has almost been taught in a way that we get the total wrong message out of it. The message is all about self-righteousness. And in the description or in the story of, of Jonah, he says that all of us have this tendency in us to be incredibly incredibly self-righteous and self-righteousness is a problem and Jonah who writes this story about himself describes how he was incredibly self-righteous looking down on others judging other people feeling like he was better than other people and the theme of Jonah as we summarize the book today is that self-righteousness is like the law of gravity Self-righteousness is like the law of gravity. It's invisible. It's all around us. It affects everyone, as you just saw with the rubber band moving, or if you didn't have the guts to be honest, you know you should have moved the rubber band. It affects all of us. And what that self-righteousness does, like gravity that pulls us down, it, it helps us, it, it, it drives us to look down on other people for the way they don't care for their lawn or the way they overcare for their lawn or the way they go too fast, or the way they go too slow. Self-righteousness is like the law of gravity. It's invisible, it affects everyone, and it causes us to look down on other people who are unlike us or think differently from us. Well, as Jonah addresses that, this law of gravity, it reminds me a little bit of the man who supposedly invented gravity. If you're familiar with uh, his story, his name is Sir Isaac Newton. And he probably needs a better press agent because most people know of him sitting under that apple tree. But he did so much more. Modern physics, modern mathematics can all be traced back to Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton was a pretty amazing guy in several ways. One of which was the work he did on uh, gravity and its pull on the planets, building on what Johann Kepler had done. Pretty amazing stuff. But his work in mathematics... Um, is only one of the things he does in physics. He actually was a very strong follower of Christ. As a strong follower of Christ, one of the things that is striking about Sir Isaac Newton is that he believed the Bible was true. The father of physics? He believed that Jesus Christ was who he says he was and that the Bible was historical. And he was always intrigued that his fellow friends were not necessarily, even skeptical ones, looking into the truth that he found in the Bible. And as he discussed gravity, he said several things I think are worth noting. Some great quotes. Number one, gravity explains the motions. Go back one. Gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot explain the one who sets the planets in motion. There's a mystery to the world. There's something greater at stake here. He said, yet one thing secures us, whatever betide. The scriptures assure us that the Lord will provide. Father in the physics. But I love this quote. I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but I cannot calculate the madness of people. Boy, isn't that truth? And I think he was noting on what Jonah's going to talk about. There's this madness of each one of us to feel self-righteous that acts like the law of gravity he discovered. So we're going to look at how gravity uses us, the self-righteous gravity, and then how God can use gravity to help teach us some lessons. So, how do we keep this idea of gravity from affecting us? Well, four gravitational pulls towards self-righteousness I think we all need to wrestle with. The first one we see in the opening chapter of the book of Jonah. See, the thing about Jonah is, 
Jonah, who's writing this letter about himself, is always pointing his finger at other people. God shows up and says to Jonah, I would really like you to go and tell the Ninevites that I, that I love them, I want to forgive them, and they need to make some changes in their life. And Jonah is like, who do you want me to go talk to? Those people? And as he points his finger at those people who don't do things, don't worship the same way, don't, don't look at life the same way, he is like, I am not going to go talk or help those people. And here's that self-righteousness. And here becomes our first gravitational pull. We discover that we are the very thing we hate. See, the book of Jonah opens up and he says, God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, I want you to go and, and speak to the Ninevites. And he's like, those people, the Ninevites, the wicked people, the wrong people, the people who flee from the presence of God people. And you're like, oh man, he's got a real problem. He's even more loving. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the Ninevites for a second. Nineveh was the capital city of the empire of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians came in in history and brutally brutally attacked Israel, killing some of Jonah's family members, raping, putting meat hooks through many of people he knew and dragging them behind chariots. If a man was ever justified in being angry toward a group of people, it was probably Jonah. And Jonah says, God, you're going to give those people another chance? You're going to forgive those people? You want me to help those people? And here's going to the next slide. Here's what the verse says. He says, those people are wicked. I don't want to love those people. I look down on those people. I, I, I'm not one of those kind of people. And so Jonah, who says about the Ninevites, they're wicked and they flee God's presence. They flee God's word. They don't do the moral standards of the golden rule. Jonah chapter 1 tells us that he, Jonah, arose and fleed from the presence of the Lord. He became the very thing he hated. He fleed from the presence of the Lord. If you see this on a map, it's interesting because he starts off in Israel, and had he headed to Nineveh, he would have gone east, northeast a little bit. He gets on a ship to go to the farthest possible point in the known world to get away from God's plan. He's heading to Tarshish. He's become the very thing he hates. He's discovered he is the very thing he hates. He's the kind of person who runs from the presence of the Lord. Like, wow, thank goodness I'm not like Jonah. Are you? You ever get really frustrated at gossips? I do. You ever found yourself talking about with maybe a friend? Did you hear what Julie said? Julie, actually, her daughter was talking about my daughter and spread some rumors about her. And I am really, really annoyed that she would be such a bad parent that she couldn't control her daughter in such a way. What am I doing? I'm gossiping about a gossip. I become, I'm the very thing I hate. You say, you know, I really believe in tolerance. I think tolerance is very important. And then you meet somebody who's intolerant. And aren't you intolerant toward the intolerant? Don't you gossip about the gossips? Don't you judge those who judge you? Don't you critique the critiquers? You see, we have all that self-righteous in us. The very thing that drives us crazy, the very thing we point our finger at, is the very thing we're often guilty of. Joseph Epstein, in his book, Snobs, Snobbery, a great book. And in the book, he describes the percentage. They, they did a percentage study and found that over 90% of people in America can't stand snobs. Wow. Over 90, I think it's like 98%. So think about that for a second. What does that statistic tell us? That we feel better than people who feel better than others. We look down our nose at people who look down their nose at others. We're snobs toward the snobs. We've become the very thing we hate. It's the gravitational pull that pulls on all of us. Now, again, Jonah's saying, I discovered this about myself. The second thing we discover is not only do we become the very thing we hate, if we're honest about our own self-righteousness, we discover that that law of gravity is pulling on us. The second thing we discover here in the, in the story or the account is that rebellion is often more curable than religion. Remember, Jonah is a prophet. He's a man of God. And as a man of God, 
it's part of the fact that he has obeyed, that he's tried to do the right thing that's caused him to be so incredibly self-righteous. And so even though he's on this ship and he's heading off you know, to Tarshish to get away from God because he doesn't want God to forgive his enemies, he doesn't want to care for those who, who he hates and can't stand and they don't deserve God's mercy, even though he's there, he's going to find himself in an incredible irony. He, the angel, the prophet, he, Jonah, is running away from God. He gets on a ship with a group of people who do not believe the way he believes, and they wouldn't be considered religious, they might be considered rebellious. And so if you're looking at these rebellious shipmates who do not believe in his God, the story is striking, because what we find is that these rebellious people are more in tune with God than the religious people. Now, how can that be? How could the Bible be criticizing religion and almost saying that being rebellious puts you in a better place than being religious because you're more open to what God might do? That's exactly what it's going to say. In fact, as they're in the ship, the ship's eventually going to go down. But... Before it goes down, they're in the middle of a storm. In the middle of the storm, something pretty powerful occurs. And that is a tempest or a great storm strikes the ocean that they're on. And all of these rebellious people are like, oh my goodness, we need to seek God. We need to ask God for help. Think about that. The rebellious people are saying, let's seek out a higher purpose, a higher calling, let's get God's help. Oh my goodness, we've never seen a storm like this. The religious guy isn't seeking God. The religious guy is asleep in the bottom of the boat. And what the story and all of its twists and turns have is that the rebellious people are more in tune with God than the religious guy is. And he's looking down on this religious guy in the same way he looks down on the Ninevites, I'm better than they are. He, the religious guy, has put the rebellious people in danger because of his actions and he doesn't even care. Because he's so incredibly self-righteous. Here's how it says it in the text. I'll read the verse to you here. Next verse. Now these are the rebellious shipmates, maybe for a better word. And they wake up Jonah and say, Arise, Jonah! Call on your God! Perhaps your God will help us so we won't perish! We need help here! So the rebellious people are calling for a prayer meeting. The rebellious people are waking up Jonah. And they say, For whose cause? Let's ask our God, For what cause is this occurring to us? Why are we going through this difficult storm? And Jonah wakes up and says, Well, let me tell you. Unlike you people, who clearly are not in line with God, I fear the God who made the heavens and the earth. Huh. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. Oh my goodness. Well, why have you done this? Because Jonah goes on to tell them how he outran or tried to outrun the presence of the Lord in their ship. He doesn't seem concerned. He doesn't seem bothered. He's totally allowed his relationship with God, his religiosity, to reinforce his apathy and complacency. He in no way feels motivated to pray. He in no way feels motivated to save the lives of those people who he's put in danger. He doesn't care. And yet, at the same time, he can answer a Bible trivia test. I fear the Lord who made heaven and earth. Well, this makes the... The rebellious people even more concerned. Oh my goodness, you ticked off the guy who's in control of the sky? We're really in trouble. And they go on the next verse, and here's what they say. Next slide. Oh, pick me up. Sorry, go back. I didn't realize you had advanced. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. He knows it. Look at He knows it. He knows that his religiosity and his inability or, or desire to never go to Nineveh is what's caused this. He's like, you know what? Just throw me over the sea and let me die. So why is he contemplating suicide? We've got to go back to Nineveh. He says, I would rather be dead than live in a world where God forgives my enemies. I would rather be dead than see my enemies forgiven. 
I would rather be dead than see people I hate forgiven and shown mercy by God. Man, I can relate to that. And here's the irony again. These rebellious people care more for the religious guy than the religious guy cares for the rebellious people. And they row hard. Oh my goodness, we've got to save this guy. We don't want to throw him over. Come on, we've got to row hard. And all night long, they're rowing and rowing and rowing. They're trying to do whatever they can to help this self-righteous religious guy who is sleeping and not trying to help them in their moment of need. And eventually, like, God, please, oh my goodness, you made a heaven. We don't, want to, we don't want to get out of line with you the way that guy is. But don't hold this against us. And they take Jonah and they throw him out into the water. And, sure enough, they picked up Jonah, threw him in the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men, the, the, the rebellious people, feared the Lord, Jonah's God, and make sacrifices and vows to him. And here again we see, in a difficult circumstance, how the rebellious people are more in line with God than the religious guy. How can this be? I was talking to a friend recently who we went to lunch, and he said, you know, Chad, I certainly have questions about science and I have questions about philosophy as it relates to faith. But you know, the biggest obstacle I have to believing the way you believe? I said, I can guess, but go ahead and tell me. He said, hypocrisy. Christians who pretend to be about loving and caring and tolerant, and yet when they act out, I don't see love. I see anger. I see self-righteousness. What keeps me from considering the message is just how incredibly arrogant Jesus' followers are. I'm like... You know, because their religion has made them feel better than people who aren't as religious. And that's what religion can do. And that's why rebellion can be far more curable than religion. Remember a guy came to our church seven or eight years ago when we were in Cincinnati Country Day. And he sort of had that walk of somebody who had it all put together. He walked into church, met me after the, his first service and says, I don't think you're doing things appropriately here at this church. It's nice to meet you, too. I just left my last church because they weren't doing things right. And he just knew how everything should be done, what kind of music you should sing or shouldn't sing, how you should greet people, what should be in the program, what font you should use on the screen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very, very self-righteous. But met him, became friends with him. But always judging, always looking down, always the expert. About two years went by, and he came to my office one day and set up an appointment he came in the office and he had tears in his eyes. Even though his posture had changed, he sat down. He said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. He said, you know how at times I've come across a little arrogant? <laughs> yeah. He said, I got to tell you, I've been living a duplicitous life. Last 15 years, I pretended to be this great Christian who had all put together but I have had ongoing affairs going on. I've had an addiction to pornography. I found myself in massage parlors with men and women. And I am just so ashamed and so guilt-ridden in my marriage. And my whole family is at stake here. And I'm worn out from living a fake life. Now, over the next six months, we built a friendship and a relationship. And for the first time in his life, he was finally able to start moving in a healthier direction. Because he was then pretending to be one thing and to start working towards something else. And here was the irony. He was lost in his religion. But it was when he found out what a rebel he was that God actually finally began to get hold of his heart. And we need to be careful not to get religious. Because religious people feel better than people who aren't as religious. They come some list of rules. In fact, some of you are here today because you're saying, hey, I'm coming to Horizon and I'm enjoying it. But I tell you, what really I, I turned me off to church for years is exactly what you're talking about. People were so self-righteous, uh, Christians who thought they were better than you because they had some arbitrary list of things they did or didn't di do, and they, they felt like they were better than us because of it. And the book of Jonah is so honest in saying, if you've been frustrated by religious Christians, by religious people, boy, the Bible and God is equally as frustrated by that. The second gravitational pull is that religion isn't as curable as rebellion. The third gravitational pull is an interesting one because here in the text we find something interesting is that we're all often so busy looking down on our enemies, our ex-spouse, our business partner, that, that person who did that thing to us, it was our dad, it was our son who ran off, whatever it was. We're so busy looking down on other people 
that we don't realize that we need as much mercy as our enemies. So he's in the sea. And remember, Jonah is glad to be in the sea because he would rather be dead than have to go tell his enemies that God might forgive them. As strange as that is, that is actually how strongly he hates the Ninevites. He would rather be dead than to be in a world where they are forgiven. He would rather be dead than have to go and tell them that God might forgive them after everything they did to his family, to his friends, to his people. And as he's falling down into the sea, the book of Jonah tells us that God sends a great fish. And that great fish comes and it swallows him up. And Jonah gets swallowed. And instead of dying like he hoped, (laughs) he is instead finding himself in the belly of a whale. And on his way down, he cites that he's on his way to Sheol, which is the word for death in the Hebrew culture. In fact, there are many commentators who believe that he actually dies in that whale. Because Jesus will later reference that in the same way Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and then three nights, so too I will be in the grave three days and three nights. In the same way that God had to resurrect Jesus, some people take the view that God actually allowed him to die. And part of that's actually what he says here, because he says some interesting things. He says, as I was falling down to the grave, as weeds were wrapping around my neck, I pray to God, help me, I need mercy, I've rebelled against you, I need your help. And for the first time, Jonah's starting just a hint to realize he needs mercy as much as his enemies need mercy. He needs help as much as they need help. I think we've got to pause here for a moment. Because many people say, Chad, this is why I can't take the Bible seriously. I mean, honestly. Maybe that's like, that's like Pinocchio, maybe. A Pinocchio that happened, you cannot ask me to believe that this is an actual historic book and that a human being actually was swallowed up by a whale. Now, I happen to believe that's a historic event. But let me just give you some some things to ponder. Number one, a human being would fit in a sperm whale if you fit it in today. So there is actually room for that to happen. A couple of other-sized whales as well. So it is actually physically possible. Two, supernaturally, philosophically, if God is all-powerful, and if God really is at work in the story... And isn't it logical that an all-powerful God could do all-powerful things? Wouldn't it be a bigger problem to read a book that says God did ama- came to earth and did amazing things, and you read the book and nothing amazing happened? Often we come to the Bible with what's called an anti-supernatural uh, presupposition. We say, I know that supernatural things don't happen, therefore if I see it, it can't be true. I would just encourage you to make, open your mind a little bit and say, if this really happened, and if God really was involved, then yes, it is possible that that could happen. Thirdly, though, is sometimes people struggle in this, this part of the Bible is they can't believe he survived for three days. Well, keep in mind that many people think he died because he says, my, my, I cried out from Sheol, from the grave, out of the belly of death. I died here and God has to resurrect him. However, C.S. Lewis, who is a famous Christian apologist and thinker, he believed that the book of Jonah was God's word, but he did not think it actually happened. He believes that there's hints in the text that this is in the Bible a purposely written fictional story. And so it tells you up front it's a fictional story, and then you could take it for an allegory and for lessons learned. And so if C.S. Lewis can say, hey, Jonah wasn't a struggle for me and my faith, maybe you could say oh, you know what, I don't want to be a struggle for mine. I want to learn the lesson here. Now, I don't hold that position. I sort of go with, and I'm a pretty simple guy, I think Jesus, the, the, the evidence for Jesus' death and resurrection in history is so strong. And Jesus believed that Jonah really was in the whale. Jesus really cited that he was dead, or at least was in it for three days and three nights. So I sort of go with, I'm going to go with the view of the guy who raised himself from the dead. Um, now, that may be overly simple because you're like, I don't even necessarily believe that. But I'm just saying, as you're wrestling through this, those are some things to think about. Now, Jonah is discovering that he needs mercy as much as the very people he's judging. So, the passage goes on and says that God then takes him back to the shore and has the whale vomit him out. Now, here again we see Jonah receiving mercy. Because remember... There's two ways out of a whale. (laughs) 
So even now we're seeing God's mercy because he could have come out one of two different directions. God mercifully let him come out the front end, not the back end. But Jonah, who doesn't think his enemies deserve mercy because he's so busy looking down on them, isn't appreciating that he too need mercy and got mercy. God rescued him. God saved him. God delivered him. And God even let him get vomited out. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school, here's how you heard the lesson. Jonah was disobedient. He went into a whale. Now he's obedient. No, he is not. In fact, that gets us to our fourth gravitational pull. <coughs> and that's this. External obedience can hide rather than expose a self-righteous heart. So you can say, hey, I am definitely got my act together because I'm I'm starting to go to church these days. Or I'm definitely doing better because look at all the good things I'm doing for people. Or in Jonah's case, look, I'm finally going to Nineveh. And, And in that moment, it can look like you've become a new person. It can look like you've become humble or you've become teachable. But you are just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Nothing has changed in your heart. And I would suggest to you that Jonah is just as angry, just as mad, just as self-righteous at the Ninevites that he's ever been. And though he's put on the sheep clothing of making it look like he's obeying God, he is in his heart as angry as ever. He's doing this only because God is forcing him to do it. So even though on the outside it looks like, well, look how Jonah's finally obeying. Isn't this wonderful? Underneath his religious exterior is a heart that is as angry as ever toward his enemies. He hates his enemies. He can't stand what they have done. So the scriptures come and say, for the second time, God appears to Jonah, second time, and says, I want you to go to the Ninevites, and I want you to deliver the message I'll give you to to deliver. Fine, I'll go. So Jonah arose, and he goes to the city of Nineveh, A great, exceedingly great city, a three days journey extent. He began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out, here's his message. As we're going to find out in the next chapter, he doesn't deliver what God said. He delivers his own message. Forty days and you're out of here. Forty days and God's going to crush this place. Forty days and exactly what you have coming for you is coming. I feel much better now. And after this three day journey of giving this speech... Shockingly, the Ninevites go, you are right, we are way out of line. You are right, we are so broken. And it says that they believed God and God relented from harm and God forgave them. He saw their works of fasting and asking for forgiveness and God relented from doing harm. Again, a lot of people think the Old Testament God is very angry. Jonah is like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. God says, I love people who did severe, horrible things to my people and to my temple and to my, my friends. But I love them enough to pursue them. I want to forgive them. I want to relent from people experiencing the consequences in their life. And Jonah, in one of the most successful missionary journeys ever, has an entire city turned to him. To which, again, we get an obstacle to why most people don't believe the book of Jonah. Come on! A whole city turns to God after one bad fire and brimstone sermon? Well, keep in mind who's delivering it first. This guy has been in the belly of a whale for three days, gastric acid, bleach white. It's like the walking dead. Ooh, 40 days and God is coming. I mean, this guy looks horrible. You talk, oh my, what happened to you? I was in a fish and God, I've tried not to come here, but here I am. I mean, this guy looks like the walking dead. But if you do a little study on the Assyrian Empire, and a little study on Nineveh in particular, they actually worshipped two particular gods during this time in history. One was called Dagon, and the other was called Nosh. And what's fascinating about how God perfectly orchestrated this to get the people's attention is that they worshipped the fish god, Dagon, and the fish god, Nosh. And so as Jonah shows up with his story of how he was spit out of a fish with all the evidence of him being eaten you know, by the acid on his body from that fish, The people's superstition and the people's cultural reference point was a perfect way for them to hear and say, oh my goodness, we are open to this message. But I still want to propose to you that Jonah is angrier than ever. Because instead of saying, wow, what a great preacher I am. Wow, what an amazing thing I did. Jonah goes the other way. And Jonah 
having seen all the people respond, stomps his way up to a mountaintop and looks down on the people. Which brings us to our last point. See, self-righteousness is a gravitational pull to pull us downward toward others. Now, how will God use gravity to get his attention? God is going to use literal gravity to expose his self-righteous gravity. He walks his way up. He's sitting up on a hillside and he's looking down at the city of Nineveh. Why? Is it to celebrate the great work he did? Is it to go, wow, look at the amazing thing God did through my speech? No, 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 no. Jonah is ticked off. He is ticked off that the people have turned to God. He's ticked off they're not going to get what's coming to them. He's ticked off that God is not going to give his enemies what they deserve. So he sits. More accurately, he pouts. He thinks, if I look sullen enough, if I look mad enough, God will so want to make me happy. I can manipulate God into still destroying my enemies, even though they have turned back to him. So he sits up there on this mountaintop, hoping that God will still destroy his enemies. And as he's up there pouting, God sends a wind, a very hot breeze upon him. And he's, oh, it's so hot. And he's feeling discomfort. And he's feeling the pain of being in a 115, 125 degree weather that can be in that time, in, in that area during that time. And so in his moment of feeling the fire or the, the, the breeze or the discomfort, God sends him a plant. If you do some study on some of the agriculture in that area, there's some plants that grow you know, many, many feet overnight. So again, this could be supernatural, but there are some plants that actually do grow pretty fast over in that area of the country. And so God sends this plant to give him some shade from the 125 degree weather. And Jonah says he loves the shade. He loves the fact that he got relief from, from this. He loves the fact that he gets to sit in the shade. And so while he's sitting in the shade, God begins to listen in to what he's saying. And he says, I'd be better off dead than to live in a world with forgiven Ninevites. And he waited for God to destroy the city. And then he tells us what the whole book was really all about. He says, I knew it! I knew it! I knew if I came to Nineveh, I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God. I knew that you were too kind, too slow to anger, and that you would relent from doing harm. I knew it! Old Testament God. Jonah knew he was just too nice. That if given an opportunity, he would love to forgive Jonah's enemies. And Jonah said, I can't do it. I cannot live in a world with forgiven Ninevites. I'm better than them. I don't need forgiveness like they do. I didn't do the kind of things they did. And all that self-righteousness. He said, it is better for me to be dead than to live in this kind of world. And God tenderly comes alongside him and says, is it right for you to be angry? To which he says, you better believe it is. It, you better believe it is. This is wrong. This is inappropriate. This is way out of line. You're way too kind here. You're way too nice here. So God sends a worm. A what? A worm. He sends a little bitty worm to crawl onto the plant. And he comes down and he eats his way into the root of the plant and the plant dies. And now... Jonah is exposed back to the elements, back to the heat. And Jonah again goes suicidal and says, Oh my goodness, I can't take it. I'm angry that the plant died. I'm angry at the stupid worm. I'm angry at all the ways in which I'm having to be discomforted here. And I'm angry that you're not judging Nineveh. And God again, so gracious and so kind, comes alongside Jonah and says these words. He says, Jonah, why do you care so much for a plant that you did not even grow? You're not showing pity or compassion for a plant. You're more angry about a plant than you are about human beings dying. You don't show pity for a plant which you did not labor nor make grow, which came up in one night and perished in another. If you care so much about a plant that you didn't grow, 
shouldn't I care about people that I did make and that I did grow? And yes, they're making horrible mistakes. Yes, they're doing wicked things. But shouldn't I, because I made them, show pity toward them? Compassion toward Nineveh? The great city in which 120,000 people live? And yes, they're wicked. But you know what I see is behind their wickedness? is These are people who cannot discern between their left hand and right. They have just so lost their way. More than that, I care about their livestock. You love animals? God loves animals. God says, let me tell you how I feel toward my people. I love them. I care for them. I even love and care for their animals. And the book of Jonah stops right there. What a weird way to end a book. He lets the question sit there for each one of us to say, do you care about more for your own comfort and your own pleasure and your own way of life than to help somebody who's your enemy? Yeah, of course. He's like, well, God doesn't. Because God was sitting in heaven, comfortable, joyful, experiencing everything he ever needed, and he looked down and saw a traitor generation, enemies, people who did not go his own way, who people spit in his face, people who ignored him though he made them, and God decided that he cared more for his enemies than his own comfort. And God left heaven and came to earth in the person of Jesus. And he came there because he cared more about us, though we were his enemies, than his own comfort. He allowed himself to experience hunger and betrayal and difficulty. He even let himself be crucified, tortured, abandoned, on a scourging post with whips and pieces of his skin ripped off. Why would God do that? Because God cares more for us and loves his enemies more than his own pleasure or his own comfort. Which is why Jesus will cite Jonah as the sign to what he came to earth to do. See, God will use literal gravity. He'll knock plants down. He'll use worms in your life. He'll use breezes in your life. God will put anything he needs to in your life through gravity. He'll let things fall down in your life to expose the self-righteousness, arrogant gravity that our hearts are drawn toward to think we're the king of the universe. Which is why I think our key takeaway today is this. We've got to make a decision. We can either be humble Or be humbled. Life's a lot like that. You can be humble, or you can wait for gravity to pull it all down and be humbled. Where you lose a marriage, you lose a relationship with the son or daughter. You say, that's not true. I got a boss who's still, you know, in operation. His company's still doing great, and he's as arrogant as ever. You know, good people leave environments like that. You will lose your best people in your department because people eventually realize, I don't want to work for somebody self righteous. And the literal gravity is you'll lose your best people, you'll lose your edge, all because you chose to be humbled rather than to be humble. And yet, this pull of gravity is so strong that we don't even see it, we don't even notice it, which is why we gave you a rubber band today. I want you just to track for yourselves for one week your attitudes and thoughts of self-righteousness and looking down over the people. And every time you catch yourself feeling like you're better than somebody else, annoyed by somebody else, I just want you to move that rubber band. And many of us on staff have been doing this for about a month. And it's amazing how few hairs we have left on our wrist. <laughs> because the pull toward that unseen force called self-righteousness is so strong. I want to challenge you for one week to ask yourself, God, help alert me to gravity in my life. Show me where I am not being humble in my life. And if you don't like the rubber band because it's going to be silly, that would be a great conversation starter when you're talking to people at work. What do you got that for? I'm trying to be more humble. If you don't want to do that, I just want to encourage you to use your phone. Every time you catch yourself this week being self-righteous, looking down at people, just move your phone from one pocket to the other. Or maybe you want to grab a coin, a quarter, and say, God, every time I catch myself, help me, help me catch myself, because I don't want to be that guy. I want to have the kind of love, even for my enemies, that you had toward me. Move that quarter from one pocket to the other or back again. See, humility is the secret to overcoming the gravitational pull of self-righteousness. You know, last week, we looked at pride being the carbon monoxide of the soul, an unseen gas that can poison you. This week, we're looking at 
the unseen, invisible force of gravity that pulls us towards self-righteousness. And as you're talking today, as you're listening today, you probably thought to yourself, man, I know somebody who needs to get this CD. My ex-spouse, my son-in-law, I'm going to send him a link to this. Almost always a sign of the pull of gravity is when you're thinking about how a message can apply to somebody else and not yourself. So I just want to encourage you and have a quick prayer to end and just ask God that he would open our eyes to the light of what's true about ourselves and others around us. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that I'm no better than my enemies. I feel better than them. But God, if I could walk in the light and just see how utterly broken my heart is, how utterly self-centered and self-righteous I can be, Father, show me how much I need mercy. For each person here today, Father, I ask that you would show them how much you love them, that you are willing from the Old Testament to the New Testament to go to great ends, to put your own comfort, your own pleasure, your own convenience to the side, to reconcile with us as traitors, as enemies, that we could be in a relationship with you and extend that kind of mercy to our enemies as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey man, well, if you've enjoyed this series, Book by Book, you can go to our website, down to Media Downloads, type in Book by Book. And on that uh, website, there's actually a chance there that for the last 20 years we've been doing this series, so probably about half the Bible's been done by now. If you want to get a 30-minute summary of every book of the Bible, at least uh, 30 or 40 of them. And then lastly, we're starting a brand new series next week called Clickbait, and we're going to discover that zombies are among us. So we'll see you next week for that. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.